Good morning, Engage. I'm CJ. I am a writer, speaker, husband, father from Brooklyn, New York, and it's a pleasure to join you today. Uh, I love your pastor, Sean. He's a great dude. Um, I'm really excited about the work that you guys have going on up there. I'm praying with you and for you as we live in the midst of this really, really weird time. And I'm praying that whatever normal is, we'll get back there soon. But today I have the pleasure of speaking with you about Ephesians 5, uh, verses 15 to 21. So we can, we can pray and we'll, we'll dive right in. Uh, Heavenly Father, we thank you that although we are not gathering in the way that we would love to gather or prefer to gather, that we can still be in your presence, that we still have options available to us, that we can still be a family. So, Father, I ask that you would be with us today as we seek to hear what you have for us in your word. Lord, I ask that you would give me clarity of mind, conviction of heart and concision of speech. I pray that I would become lesser and Jesus would become greater. Whenever there is preaching, there is the temptation to make it about self. But, Father, I ask that you would empty me and simply show Jesus today. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight, Lord. May we remember today that you are our God, you are our strength, you are our Redeemer, our Savior in whom we trust. In Christ's name, amen. So you may have heard the saying before, step on a crack, break your mother's back. Step on a line, break your mother's spine. That's probably a game you remember from childhood. I mean, I, I certainly do. We played it a lot, just walking home from school or walking to school, playing on the playground. And if you grew up in an area like mine, you had a lot of cracks and lines to avoid, but it was worth it because you were protecting your mother's life. You know, it's a, it's a cute little game that kids will play that taught us early where and how you walk matters. It's one of those early life lessons that we would carry with us. The places we would and would not go. The people we would choose to be friends with. And if we have the option, even the jobs we take. All of this is the understanding that where we walk matters. Today we're going to see Paul tell us that if it is important in all those other areas of life, if who we choose to be friends with, if where we choose to work, if the places we choose to play, if where we choose to live, if all of that matters, how much more is it important in the life of a Christian? If I can give you my sermon in a sentence today, it is simply this, watch your step. So we'll open up with verse 15, that's Ephesians 5, verse 15. Paul says, look carefully then how you walk, not as wise, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time because the days are evil. You know, we've become experts in wasting time. The average person can barely focus on a task or hold a thought for more than a few minutes these days. It's estimated that the average phone use for a person is at five hours a day, and that's millennials and boomers. So if you're tempted to think that this is just a problem for young people, no, it's all of us. We're all addicted to these smartphones, and the average use is five hours a day. I know some of us, we get that alert every single week about our screen time, and it probably says a lot more. I, I myself am guilty. The average person checks their phone 58 times a day. For some of us, it's double that. Because if we're spending five, seven, eight hours on our phones, we're picking it up more than 58 times. Our problem is we live in a state of constant interaction with technology and distractions. Think about it. When you're standing in line at the grocery store, it's nothing to scroll Instagram or Twitter or watch a quick YouTube video. When you're working from home like many of us have been, it's nothing to just check your phone every few minutes to help ease the boredom. 
And I believe that this constant interaction, this overindulgence of information has hurt us emotionally, mentally, and socially. You know, uh, depression rates are at an all-time high amongst teenagers. And a big reason for that is because of the amount of time that they spend on their phones. So what happens is they spend all their time on their phones and they're looking on Instagram and they see their friends posting pictures and they think, why am I not there? Why wasn't I invited? Or as we all do, we have insecurities and we're looking at Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and we see people posting their highlight reels and we compare that to our behind the scenes footage. All of the time that we spend in our phones, on our iPads, on our computers, it's not good for us and it is probably doing more harm than good. Now on the flip side of all of that phone use, according to the 2019 Barna study, 16% of Christians read their Bible every day. 16, one six. 31% never read it at all. So what we have here is this interesting nexus of we spend five, six, seven hours a day on our phones. We pick them up 50, 60, 70 times a day. But the overwhelming majority of us do not read our Bibles every day. We don't even touch them. Most of us struggle to pray for more than five minutes before our minds start to wander because we're so used to taking in these quick snippets of information. I heard one person describe Instagram this way. We're taking in little nuggets of nothing. That affects your brain. It affects your ability to focus. We've reduced our good Christian activity to simply posting on Instagram. We set up our Bibles nice, get our cup of coffee with a cute verse on it, and we snap the picture. But how much of the word are we actually taking in? You see, all of this combines to affect how we walk. What we are and are not taking in, what we are and are not taking in, what we are and are not indulging in, determines who we are and what we do. We cannot live like wise people if we are not spending significant time taking in the wisdom of God. I mean, you know where we've been the last few months in this country. You know the climate of things. COVID has ravaged communities, shut down various parts of the entire country and is still doing so after five months of this. And then there's all of the civil unrest due to injustice, due to people tired of seeing people made in the image of God murdered by police. See, these, these are the times where Christians should be on the front lines speaking good, godly wisdom and truth. But instead, we find ourselves woefully unprepared. We have found ourselves unable to speak to the present cultural moment because we weren't doing what we were supposed to be doing, taking in the word of God, preparing ourselves for this day. Living wisely is the ability to be ready to go at any moment. It's as Peter says, uh, always being ready to give a defense for the hope that you have. I like to think about Mike Miller. I'm a big basketball fan. So Mike Miller played for the Miami Heat during their, their championship run, you know, when the Heatles came together, LeBron, D. Wade, Chris Bosh. Mike Miller was one of the first people they signed. Not because they expected Mike to play a ton of minutes, but because they knew that Mike was always ready. So while Mike didn't play a lot, he maybe played six or seven minutes a game. He was always crucial in those moments. He came off of the bench cold but ready to go that is how we need to be we need to be ready to come off the bench in the midst of covid 19 in the midst of civil unrest and be ready to hit that clutch shot but see you don't wake up just ready to do that you don't just get up one day and say all right i'm here let's do it i'm ready to speak to the deep issues of the moment i'm ready to put my full christianity on display no it takes hours of practice and silence Hours of practice when nobody is looking. Mike Miller was famous for midnights at the gym. Famous 
for putting in long hours, putting up hundreds of shots after practice was over because he understood that it's not the work that everybody was watching that mattered, but the work that he was doing behind the scenes. We should have been ready to speak to the culture right here, right now, about how paramount it is to put the safety of others before ourselves, to put the safety of others before our conveniences. It hurts us nothing to put a mask on when we walk into the grocery store, but it speaks volumes of how we feel about the lives of others when we do that. We should have been ready to talk to the culture about what it looks like to listen to the voices of the oppressed and marginalized and examining our systems and structures to seek the flourishing of all people. We should have been ready to do that. See, there are organizations that have sprung out of these movements that are completely anti-gospel. But the reason that they were able to do that and fill this void is because the church created one. The church created the void where she should have been. She wasn't. We were sitting on the sidelines, waiting for some moment. What moment? I couldn't tell you, but we weren't where we should have been. You know, we, we like to think of our lives as these big, grand narratives. We think of these giant, earth-shattering, world-changing moments. But the truth is, we probably get three or four of those big moments in our lives three or four really big decisions. 99% of life is boring. It's the mundane of the everyday. It's the getting up, taking a shower, getting the kids together, going to work, coming home, play with the kids, rinse and repeat. But it's exactly how we live in those everyday moments that inform how we act in the big ones. See, you don't wake up and suddenly become Someone else, someone else when the moment arises. You don't get up and just wake up into this big moment and now pull from a reservoir of talent and knowledge that you don't have. So how we do in those little moments matter. What we are doing in the everyday matters. How you work, not cutting corners, but putting your best foot forward matters because if you do it in the little time, you're gonna do it when the big moment comes. Whether or not you take the time to read scripture and pray daily, that matters because when the big moment comes, the two or three that we get in life, you will be equipped with the knowledge of God to handle that season. In those tough moments with your kids, which come often, Choosing to parent to the heart and not the action is what matters. I have a two and a half year old and an eight month old. I know what those hard moments are like. I know what it's like to want to just speak to the behavior and not to the heart. But it is those little moments that will determine what happens in the big ones later. All of these things, they matter. Paul tells us a grim truth about this world. The days are evil. They are. You don't need to look far to know that. We live with all manner of injustice. Our bodies are broken. I am 32, almost 33, and I feel it every day. I used to play a lot of basketball, and now for some reason my hips just hurt all the time. We live in decaying bodies. The days, the days are long. Many of you know what I'm talking about. You work nine to five, but it feels like you're working nine to nine. But it is in the midst of all of this that God tells us to make the best use of the time. God looks into this world that we live in where none of it catches him by surprise. And he says, okay, there's all sorts of injustice. Your body is decaying. The days are long and you are tired, but still make the best use of the time. And this is about more than being efficient, but it is about maximizing every single moment for his glory and our good. To live wisely is to understand that we live today in light of what we know to be true about tomorrow. And what we know to be true about tomorrow is that we don't live in the midst of some epic battle between good and evil. No. We know how the story ends. This is the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords coming back to wipe out sin and restore and renew all things. 
This isn't some epic battle where all of the Avengers have to get together to team up to beat Thanos. No. This is God coming through. This is Jesus, the rider on the white horse, cracking the sky and saying it is finished. That is it. There, there is no actual battle. It's Jesus saying it is done and then it's just done. He restores and he renews all things. This is the day that we long for. This is the day that is our motivation and pushes us to keep going even when the outcome seems bleak. When your bosses are being awful again. When your kid just can't get it straight. When you find yourself crawling back to that old addiction that you thought you beat. We fix our eyes on the day to come when all things will be made new. This is what motivates the Christian. This is what pushes us to pursue God's glory, to pursue excellence in his name and not our own. So to give us some insight on that, Paul says in verse 17, therefore, do not be foolish, but understand the will, what the will of the Lord is and do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, debauchery, but be filled with the spirit. There are two types of lives, one filled by the spirit and one filled by something else. This will determine how you live. What you are filled with will determine where you go, what you do, and most importantly, what you are known for. You know, Jesus says that out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. I think what he was getting at there is whatever is inside of you, whatever is filling you, whatever is informing you is eventually going to come out of your mouth. And what comes out of your mouth will display itself in your actions, and that is what you will be known for. See, the truth is, we are all led by something. There is a, a type of life that is enslaved to the flesh. This isn't the same as wrestling with sin, right? Because we're all going to wrestle with sin. You know, Paul reminds us in Romans 7, you know, there's the things that I do that I don't want to do, and the things that I don't want to do, I do. Wretched man that I am, who will save me from this body of death? That is all of us. We all wrestle with sin, war with it in some capacity, but there is a type of life that is just given over to it. There is a type of life that says, I am going to completely turn myself over to my sins. It's a life marked by the pursuit of lust. Whether that be drinking or sex or monetary ambitions. See, we hear the word lust and we just think sex, but we lust after a lot of things. Status, fame fortune. It is a life with you at the center of it, chasing whatever you want. Your selfish ambitions are all that matter. That is a life enslaved to the flesh. But then there is a different life, a life marked by the spirit, a life lived in the wisdom of God, where you lay down your rights and privileges for the sake of others. A life where you seek to honor God in all that you say and do. A life in which you are guided by the spirit of God that dwells in you. That is the life that Jesus has called, to, called us to live. I think that a life filled with the spirit will show itself in three ways. One is it seeks to know God deeply. Two is it seeks the flourishing of others. And Three, it is a life lived out in community. So let me, let me unpack those for you guys. So it is a, a life that seeks to know God deeply. Remember what I said. Remember I said practice matters. That you don't just come in off the bench ready to go without ever having put the work in. For the Christian, those are spiritual disciplines. We think about prayer, fasting. We, we think about time in solitude. We think about those quiet times. It's all the things that we do to get to know the Lord more richly and more deeply. Not for our own credentials so that we could posit ourselves forth as super Christians. Not so that we can show everyone just how much of our Bibles we have highlighted, but it's to know God in the depth 
of his love for us through Jesus. And so we root ourselves in the word of God. We know him and who he is based on what he has said to us about himself and not what we think we know about him. See, you have to worship the God of the Bible and not the God that you made up in your head. You know, if, if your God agrees with everything that you agree with and hates everything that you hate, then the God you worship is you and not the God of the Bible. I think we've, in our culture, we've done an excellent job of crafting a God in our own image, but we need to know God as he has revealed himself. We need to know God because it is his goodness that we trust, not our own. Our goodness is never good enough, but the goodness of God never fails. I was reading Lamentations 3 this morning, and in it, Jeremiah talks about all the ways in which he has felt the affliction and the pain and the wrath of God. But he says, even still, I will trust him. Great is your faithfulness, O Lord. As I sit in the midst of persecution and the Babylonian exile and I experience it and witness it firsthand, I know that it is still your goodness that I lean on each and every day. See, it is the goodness of God that carried the Israelites out of Egypt. It's the goodness of God that sustained them in that Babylonian exile. It's the goodness of God that sent his only son to die for us. It is the goodness of God that sustained the church through hundreds of years of persecution and torment. It is his goodness that got you through that hard time that you are facing. And it is his goodness that keeps us going each and every day and will bring us on the other side of this present moment. It is his goodness that we lean into and not our own. Engage. This is why we need to know the God of the Bible, because the one that we made up in our heads will always fall short when real life hits. You will find that if what you are worshiping is money, it won't be able to sustain you in the hardest of times. Your spouse and your kids will not. Peace will not be found in the bottom of a bottle, but it is in God we find promises for rest that this world and anything it can offer us will never give us. We know this because every time a new iPhone comes out, we rush to go get it. Because the peace that we were offered in the 10 or in the 11 is going to be replaced by the peace offered in the 12. And that'll last you a year? Not really. Two weeks after you get the phone, you forgot where you put it. But God offers us a different kind of peace. Number two was a life led by the Spirit seeks the flourishing of others. You know, Jesus models sacrificial love for us when he stepped off his throne and entered humanity. Paul says that even though he was equal with God, he did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped. He emptied himself and put on human flesh for us. John says it this way, that he is the word who became flesh, who stepped into this broken world to make us a part of his family. Jesus shows us what it looks like to disadvantage yourself for others. Bearing the undeserved wrath of God so that you and I might be made free. What would it look like for you to do that? To seek the flourishing of Albany. Where, where can you give up some of your excess so that others may thrive and survive? That question, whenever I ask it in whatever context it is in, it, it's always a hard one because it cuts right at the heart of everything we've been taught. We've been told to gather as much as you can, to build your tiny little kingdom because that is how you win. It doesn't matter who you step on to get there. It doesn't matter how many relationships you break. You just need to get all that you can to be as comfortable as you can here and now. But what this false wisdom doesn't tell you is that it is never enough. The more you get, the more you need. We find ourselves never satisfied. John Rockefeller, at one point, the richest man in the world, was asked by a reporter, John, you've got it all. You've got everything. How much more money do you need? Legend has it that John gives a little smirk and replies, 
just a little more. See, it's never enough. But a life led by the Spirit that pours itself out for the sake of others, that is more committed to giving and then taking, is a life that is truly satisfied. I love what the Apostle Paul says in 2 Corinthians 8, 13 through 15. He says, for I do not mean that others should be eased and you burdened, but that, that as a matter of fairness, your abundance at the present time should supply their need so that their abundance may supply your need, that there may be fairness. As it is written, whoever gathered much had nothing left over and whoever gathered little had no lack. This is a hard challenge, but one that we should cheerfully and gracefully accept. And I know you are probably thinking right now, you don't know my life. I have nothing to give up. I'm barely making ends meet. But this just, this isn't just about money. Do you have time? Do you have skills? Do you have knowledge that you are hoarding for yourself and should be used as a blessing to others? Maybe you are like my mother and you love to crochet. What would it look like for you to take that skill of crocheting and make some blankets for other people? I live in Brooklyn where it's already too cold for me in the winter. Albany winters are a lot worse. What a blessing could that be? Or maybe you are someone who has done well for yourself financially and you have skills and knowledge about financial literacy and wisdom that you can share with others. Maybe you can start to teach classes to people in the community or just with Engage, Engage itself. And say, so here is the, the, the path to being a better steward with what you've been given. Yes, we should absolutely be giving away our money. But we also, so many of us, have so much more that we can use to be a blessing to others. No matter what you think your position is in this life, you have something to offer this world. You can be and are a blessing because you are endowed with the image of God. So if you take nothing else today, know that you are made in the image of God. You are fearfully and wonderfully made and God loves you. God adores you. He cherishes you as his daughter or as his son. And he has given you unique gifts and abilities that you can share with this world. The third way a life lived by the Spirit shows itself is that it is lived out in community. For this, we refer to verse 19. Paul says, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart, giving thanks always and for everything to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, submitting to one another out of reverence for Christ. The Christian life is meant to be lived in public. I've come across so many people who, who say to me, yeah, yeah, I'm a Christian, but my faith is private. I don't, I don't really like to talk about that. But that is a lie of the enemy. There is no example of a Christian who is by themselves. Your faith is personal, but it's not private. You were saved into a family. You were saved into a community. There are 59 one another commands in the New Testament. We're told to love one another, bear with one another, exhort one another, admonish one another. 49 of those relate directly to life in the church. To be a Christian is to be a part of a family. It's to be a part of a church. You see, flourishing for the Christian is found in the midst of other believers seeking to know Jesus well. But this means you got to let people in. And this is hard because I know that we have all experienced church hurt on some level. I think if you put anybody in a room and you ask them to explain all the ways in which the church has failed them or hurt them, there are very few people who will come out with no stories. We all have some story. But if the church was full of perfect, perfect people, where would you go? You see, we imperfectly but honestly pursue Jesus together as family. If the church was full of perfect people, then our flawed selves, because I know I'm flawed, would have no place to go. But in our flaws, in our imperfectness, we come together by the power of the Holy Spirit and pursue Jesus Christ and Him crucified. 
You know that saying that you are like the people you spend the most time with. We need people around us who are going to point us back to Jesus. If all of the people that you surround yourself with are cynical and negative, what do you think you're going to be? But if all the people around you are loving Jesus and pursuing him with their whole hearts, that's going to have an effect on you as well. You are going to be inspired and motivated and held accountable for what you are doing in your relationship with Christ. So I, I spend a fair bit of time here in Brooklyn preaching to a church of 65 to 75 year olds. And I'm in my 30s, as I've mentioned. And then in my previous job, I worked with college students. So I, I, I've got this weird cross section of friends who are in their 20s, their 30s, 40s, 60s and 70s. And I find that every single one of us is asking the same question. For where we are in life, how do I live in labor? What does it mean for me to be a Christian every single day? I think good Christian community will help you to answer that question. You see, we are running this race until the very end. But we need to run it together because this is a marathon and not a sprint. We need each other. We need to be side by side encouraging one another. Helping one another to continue to pursue Jesus. James says in uh, chapter 1 that those of us who endure to the end will receive the crown of life. Endure to the end. There is no retirement for the Christian. This isn't like our working careers where we work for 40 years, cash out our 401k or our pension or get our social security and just move on. No, this is until the very end. Until our last breaths. You don't age out. So if you are older right now and you're watching this and you're thinking, I've done my time. No, your time isn't up until the Lord calls you home. And if you are young and you are tired and you're thinking, how much longer do I have to be this good Christian before I can bow out? The answer is there is no point where you get to bow out. There's no exit ramp. We pursue Jesus until the very end of our days. But you're going to need others to help you cross that finish line. You're going to need others who are walking with you. You're going to need others who are going to call you on your mess. On those, those times where you are tempted to go astray, you need solid people in your life who can help pull you back. Engage. Hear me today. You need to watch your step. How we walk matters. It's not enough to not do bad things, but you also have to actively pursue righteousness. Being filled with the Spirit is going to push you in a certain direction. And being filled with anything else is going to push you in the completely opposite direction. The Spirit is going to push you in a way that is not only pleasing and acceptable to the Lord, but leads to your joy. A life that walks in step with the Spirit is a life that knows joy that this world can never give. This world is full of false promises. Every advertisement is trying to sell you something that doesn't satisfy, trying to entice your heart to find hope, joy, and satisfaction in anything but Jesus. Many of us have tried to buy into those lies. Many of us have thought that the pursuit of those lusts, the pursuit of those vanities, that trying to grasp the wind, as the writer of Ecclesiastes says, we've tried it. And all it does is it, it leaves you exhausted, it leaves you tired, because it's impossible to keep up. You are trying to find new ways to scratch that itch, but it can never be soothed. I have to ask, don't you want rest today? I do. Jesus says, come to me all who are weary and burdened and I will give you rest. The wise life is one that rests in him. It is a life that walks in him and ultimately finds its peace in him. There are two wisdoms. There are two types of life. There is a life that is guided by the flesh and is that gives it into everything that the world tries to offer us. But then there is a life that is guided by the Spirit. A life guided by the Spirit 
is one that, that gives us peace. It is one that leaves us eternally secure. It is the one that gives us the ability to weather the storms of life well. It lets us look at what the world offers and say no, because we know that it is not enough. We know that it will never satisfy, and we know that it will never bring the joy that Jesus brings. I pray that you experience that truth today. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you for this church, for the work that they are doing. I thank you that they have been able to continue to gather me digitally. I ask that you would be with them, Lord, that you would touch the hearts and minds of everyone that is listening right now, and that you would show us that there are two types of way to live. There is a way to live that is pleasing and acceptable to you, and then there is a way to live that is following after the flesh. The book of Proverbs says that there is a way that seems right to a man that in the end leads to death. Father, may we not follow that path, but may we follow the path that Jesus has set before us because we can trust that his words are good and right and true, and we can trust that your words will not come back void, that you, when you said you would never leave us nor forsake us, that you were alive. Father, teach us to live as you've called us to live. Show us how to live and labor well in this life. I thank you for your son, for what he has done for us. And for anyone who is listening to this right now or watching this right now and doesn't know Jesus, I pray that they would reach out to the leadership of this church and they would ask questions and they would get to know this Jesus that saves, this Jesus that gave it up for all of us that we might have life and life more abundantly. Touch hearts and lives and minds today, Father. It's in your beautiful son's name we pray. Amen. Engage, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure to share God's word with you today. I love you guys. Be well.